to a podcast for IEEE Computer. Your host is Katina Michael, guest editor of the special on Big Data. Have you ever thought about how much data you're storing as an organization, the costs related to storing this data, and the value to your business processes? Does data have a physical lifetime, or should an organization just keep all of the data he has collected and generated? To talk to us about Big Data Governance, I'm joined today by Associate Professor Paul Tallon who is the Executive Director of the David D. Latanzi Center for Information Value at the Selinger School of Business and Management, Loyola University, Maryland. Paul is presently also a visiting scholar at the MIT Center for Information Systems Research. Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you, Peter. Can we begin by defining what big data means to you, Paul? Sure. So the, the classic definition, of course, is where there's such a, a large amount of data that inherently it's a, a very difficult task to basically process it all. And then that def definition kind of extends to volume, variety, velocity, and what I, lo I like to think of it also is around value. So I'm tending to define big data not solely around the, the volume of data, but the type of data that you're dealing with and the variety and how quickly that data is coming at you. But I think it's increasingly important to also add into that definition of big data whether that big data has value and potentially the methodologies around how you acquire that value and how potentially also the value changes over time. And do you think you've been influenced uh, with respect to this idea of value around data by your background as a chartered accountant? Definitely. So if I think back to my time working as a chartered accountant with PricewaterhouseCoopers, there were Numerous clients where perhaps in the midst of a merger and acquisition, part of the valuation of the company was where you would try to ascribe a number potentially to the amount of information or to the value of the information that the acquiring company was, was going to be uh, acquiring through the merger. So I think value is one of the things that accountants are inherently qualified to look at, but where the accounting profession I think is is being challenged is to recognize not just that information is an asset, but that that information or digital asset has value. Usually accountants are able to quantify the value of an asset by looking at its purchase price. But in terms of big data, it's really difficult to try and put a value on that, not just in terms of how much money the company has actually spent building up its big data or the amount of money that it's paid out buying databases. Because what you might find, in fact, is that the value of big data is a multiple of what you actually paid for it or what you paid to acquire the data through programs or applications. Okay, so typically what kinds of issues do large organizations face with respect to big data? So among the various issues that I, that I see organizations facing would be things like how do we put a value on it? Where do we store the data commensurate with its value? What are the risks associated with that? Perhaps we're putting high-value data on a very low-cost infrastructure, and as a direct consequence of that, we're finding that the risk associated with losing that data is quite high relative to its value. So what I find in practice is that companies are oftentimes managing their data according to what they would perceive as the cost of that data. So they're almost oblivious to the value of the data. So what they may do in practice, in fact, is to manage the data in order to drive total cost of ownership down to the lowest point possible. Unfortunately, you may end up in a situation where cheaper is not always better. Certainly, you can drive costs down and you can get a cheaper infrastructure, and that's probably a good thing for the bottom line. But what you might inadvertently have actually done is put your organization at risk because in the event that you lose access to big data or the big data is not recoverable, you might actually find that while cheaper was perhaps the good way to, to think about it, the amount of risk that flows from that cheaper decision is perhaps going to hurt you in the longer term. Right. So if we can explain that a bit more, I'm, I'm referring now to data migration concepts and issues. Is there a place for data migration in, in, in the big data world and how do we grasp that? Absolutely. So if you think of a tiered infrastructure, a storage infrastructure within an organization where tier one is perhaps the highest uh, cost infrastructure, but it's also the infrastructure that offers the greatest degree of reliability and resilience, all the way down perhaps to tier three, which might be more for archival data. What you can see there is as data changes value, over the course of time, you may want to move that data from one tier to another tier. 
the challenge that I see that organizations are facing is not just that they're not particularly capable to discover how the, the value of the, organ, of, of the data has changed, but sometimes the value can change at such an inordinately fast pace that the, the company is not in a position to automate how it moves its data from tier three to tier two to tier one, perhaps, and then all the way back down to tier three. So what I find in practice is that organizations are increasingly leaving high-value data on low-cost infrastructure, or perhaps it's the reverse, where they're leaving low-value data on very high-cost infrastructure. So part of the challenge that I see with trying to grapple with the relationship between the value of the data, the cost of managing it, and the risk associated with losing the data is being able to look within your tiered infrastructure and recognize that if data value is changing, then we probably need to move it either up in the stack or down towards the bottom of the stack. You can't necessarily also rely on automation to do that for you. Certainly, if you look at the way the companies are doing it in practice, they have a handful of metrics that they'll look at to try to give them a sense for whether the value possibly has changed. They may look at things like the date of last access or the frequency of access and try to use that as a trigger point. But what I'm tending to see in practice is that that's well, it's a useful proxy is not necessarily the best way of doing it. You might have a situation where the data is still inherently valuable. You haven't accessed it in quite some time. So the tool might think then that it's okay for it to move the data from tier one down to tier three because it thinks that the value has actually diminished where in practice perhaps the value has not diminished. In fact, it might have actually done quite the opposite. It might have increased in value. So I think the challenge that we see is that while, while data migration is a useful way to optimize your infrastructure, and it's certainly an interesting way and, and an appropriate way to balance cost with risk, organizations are not always in a position to actually optimize data migration. As I said, they're perhaps relying on automation to do it for them, or the automated tools might not be succeeding. Or if there is, in fact, an absence of tools, it might be uh, on the shoulders of an individual in the, in the data center to try to identify data that hasn't been used in a while, and then to think to themselves, is it okay for me to move it? So I see that there's actually a, there's a disconnect between the desire to optimize costs and value and risk and the ability of the organization to actually achieve that. I'm really intrigued by this notion of a, of a level of readiness of these organizations with respect to ever-increasing amounts of data being stored in the organization. They're being hit with a lot of different touch points, employees being able to, you know, upload and download data, um, particularly upload from the field, for example, if you're looking at Salesforce automation and things like that. But clients are also pushing data now to organizations. So how can we get from a reactive approach to a more proactive approach with respect to level of readiness? I think the answer to that is to design a data governance structure that is open to the ways that the organization is going to be receiving data and then can proactively try to figure out ahead of time what's the best way that we can actually manage this data in order to unlock its value. So when I think of readiness, I think of policies and procedures that the companies have put in place around things like access controls, perhaps even around things like e-discovery. Uh, they would also deal with things like chargebacks they would try to identify opportunities for migration. So when I think of readiness, I think of within the umbrella of readiness a kind of a hierarchy of policies and procedures. And as we go down through that hierarchy, we would have rights and responsibilities perhaps at the top level of the hierarchy where we're trying to figure out who are the data custodians, what are their rights and responsibilities. And as we go further down, sort of digging into the readiness concept, we would ask ourselves, so what is it that that we, when we get to the bottom of the hierarchy, when we're looking at individual users, readiness presumably means that those users are then in the position to actually begin to apply the data for decision making. So if companies are not in a, in a sort of a readiness mode, what you'll perhaps find is they're constantly reacting. By that I mean that they're discovering that well, we have data and the data is being used or perhaps misused in certain ways, well now we need to come back behind the scenes and put some policies and procedures in place to prevent users from doing things with the data that we just inadvertently didn't discover until after the fact. So when I think of readiness, I think of a, an organization that has thought very carefully and meticulously about both the opportunities that big data can present and the challenges also that big data can present. 
Unfortunately, I think in in practice, data governance is more of an art than a science. We're still in the very early stages of data governance. Organizations perhaps are learning from mistakes. It's very difficult to look across an industry and discover best practices. Certainly there are some best practices out there, but it tends to be the case that organizations evolve into data governance. They may begin with some very rudimentary policies and procedures, and then as big data becomes increasingly prevalent, perhaps if they see their costs rising, then reactively they go back and they revise what data governance policies and procedures they had in place. So certainly from the research that I've done, I haven't come across particularly very many examples of companies that would say, we have absolutely figured it out. I think you'll find that companies are perhaps inclined to think to themselves, we're okay for the moment, but as we begin to discover new uses of the data or new types of the data, perhaps we need to come back and revise our data governance structures. But certainly organizations that do not have data governance in place are certainly not in any way, shape, or form ready for what big data is going to do for them. We've talked a lot about private enterprise. Um, wanting to go towards more your, your public sector, I was at a police technology conference recently where I heard the New South Wales Police Service CIO speak uh, to the whole audience and ask the audience, you know, how long should the police service keep data for? Uh, and would you say that is the right question or the wrong question to ask? And at what point should we say, okay, we can now delete this? Or is that a redundant question? We just keep everything um, just in case we need it in the future in this big data context? I think it's certainly an important question, but I don't think that it's necessarily the best question to ask. So I would kind of step back and say, rather than asking how long should we be keeping the data and expect that the answer is going to be something like three months or six months or nine months, I think the better question to ask is, what is the value of the data? And if you think of the information lifecycle curve, you recognize that information grows in value over time, but then will eventually diminish as its level of use starts to fall off. So what you could actually argue is that for different types of data, there might be different retention periods. The, the, the practice, of course, around determining retention periods is still very much more of an art than a science. And there have been very many documented cases of organizations where they had retention periods in place where after a certain period of time, either the data wasn't stored, it was deleted outright, or perhaps it was archived. And those decisions, unfortunately, have come back to bite them subsequently. So in the area of, of public sector data, I think that you would have to grapple with the argument around if we do decide to keep data for longer and longer periods of time, what's that going to do to our costs? Certainly the, the vendors would make an argument that now that infrastructure costs are coming down and are increasingly falling, that perhaps you could justify extended retention of data, if not in fact retention of data in perpetuity. I think while that's a, an interesting argument, I think that it's perhaps a false argument because we also know that in the e-discovery space, it becomes increasingly difficult to retrieve information, particularly if you're looking through large volumes of data. So the argument around how long do we uh, retain the data and what does that do for our costs doesn't necessarily deal with the issue around how do I retrieve data once I've discovered that I actually do need to present that data either as part of a lawsuit or perhaps there's a security issue that we're looking at. So I think the e-discovery question has to guide the answer to the question, how long do we need to keep data for? There have been very many organizations that I've encountered in my research where the, the legal departments, a chief legal counsel will make the argument that at some point in the future, this data is going to be valuable to us, and so we should perhaps retain it for as long as possible, if not forever. CIOs will come back and say, well, if I was to do everything that the chief counsel was asking me for, my, my IT budget, particularly the budget allocated to storing data, would be inordinately high and I'd have really nothing left over for strategic projects. So I think what organizations need to ask themselves is how much risk are they willing to accept in terms of deleting the data that then is not subsequently available? If you can make an argument that your costs of storing data in perpetuity are essentially zero, perhaps it is the, re perhaps it is the right thing to do to go ahead and, and store that data forever. But in practice, what I can also say is that for every dollar that a company spends buying hardware, they're probably spending upwards of 5 to $7 annually managing that data. So when a chief legal counsel makes an argument that it's okay and it's necessary to store data in perpetuity, 
they don't necessarily see exactly what that means for the overall cost. There is within the corporate world a misperception that because the physical costs of buying the hardware are dropping and dropping dramatically, therefore our overall costs will perhaps also drop dramatically. But in the models that I've been able to develop, I can actually see that even with falling hardware costs, it's still very possible that with increasing amounts of data, that your overall costs might actually grow rapidly over time as you decide if you want to retain more and more data for longer and longer periods of time. Okay, so in essence, let's look into the future. Uh, what kinds of big data can we expect in the future and how big is big? So there are very many interesting areas where we can kind of see emerging technologies playing a role. So I could imagine, for example, with the whole concept of the Internet of Things, being able to put uh, devices in automobiles or perhaps in the home and to collect all sorts of interesting data around traffic patterns or utilization of electricity or living conditions. Uh, there, is, there is also an argument that we might, in fact, be able to uh, equip ourselves with cameras and audio recorders and, and record every single aspect of our, life, of our lives. There's also the argument that in the security space that satellite surveillance is going to be increasingly important, not just as a way to fight crime, but perhaps as a way to discover uh, environmental issues. Here in the, United, in the United States, the NSA, which is the National Security Agency, is responsible for securing the, uh, the country at a, at a federal level. And they're in the, in the business, obviously, of, rec of recording large volumes of satellite surveillance data. That is the sort of data that, when you look at it from a volume perspective, it, 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 it's bigger than big. And it does present, I'm sure, not just a cost issue, but a, a processing issue. How do you possibly discover through satellite surveillance video individual items that have a, a strict security implication? It's, it's not just looking for a needle in a haystack. It's literally looking for a needle in, in the universe. So how big is big going to get? That's, that's really a... Uh, a question, I think, for for the scientists to be able to identify what are the different types of data, how quickly are they growing, and I think also there's a challenge around the replication of that data. So even though the source data might be growing itself, I could think of numerous instances where universities, for example, could each get their hands on a copy of that big data and then replicate it and come up with smaller and smaller uses of that data, but each time having to replicate it. So I think how big is big question is, it, it, it's certainly going to be exponential. Uh, we can look back at the last couple of years and see the exponential growth, which has been faster than I think anybody could have predicted. I would say as we go out into the next three to five years, it's also going to be perhaps faster than anybody predicted. As we look to new innovations around, for example, tablets or the use of RFIDs, or satellite surveillance videos, or even cameras on the street, I think we're going to see a lot more data uh, coming at us faster and faster. Well, Paul, thank you for your time. You're certainly working in a very topical area of research, which is of interest to many large organizations around the world. We wish you and your extended collaborative network the very best in tackling some of the most difficult problems in data governance. Thank you. Thanks, Katina.